aspiration, a goal, something that you thought was absolutely impossible, that you'd never achieve it, almost to the point of not even trying, but you now stand on the other side of that accomplishment. It's something that you actually did. So where I'm going with this is that in the interest of achieving more, going beyond, I thought I would talk about what is beyond music libraries. What, what are the other avenues and paths that we can go down that have to do with creating music and licensing our music, but aren't necessarily specific to music libraries. Okay, so let's look at a very typical, you know, music library producer relationship. You research various libraries, Google, however you want to achieve, <laughs> however you want to gather that information. You research and find a library that you would like to work with that you feel your music is a fit for. You submit to said library. The library hopefully accepts your tracks. There's a contract involved. Your tracks go into a catalog with, with quite likely thousands of other tracks. Over a course of time, and that could be any stretch of time, your tracks eventually and hopefully get placed into a television show, a program, broadcast in some form of media or other. Subsequently, there will be what is called a cue sheet to be filled out, filed from the, the network, the program, basically identifying that they've used your track and whatever else they've used. That will eventually make its way back to a pro, your pro, performance rights organization, ASCAP, CSAC, BMI, SOCAN, uh, PRS. And then over another stretch of time, that pro, your pro, will administratively go through that process and send you a statement, hopefully with a corresponding check. But the statement will tell you where your music was placed and who placed it and, and so forth. Now that's not every single scenario with music libraries, but that's a, a pretty basic and common description of, of what that relationship looks like. But what else is there? What is beyond that model? How do we generate income and, and relationships beyond what I've just described, beyond that model. And just a bit of pretext, why I'm even talking about this is because it relates directly to the path that I've taken to be able to do what I do. And, and what I mean is I've always had several sources of income in, in the world of creating music or um, under the umbrella of music and audio. So I just wanna make you aware of, of two things that there is sources of income and, and let's say success in the music sync world beyond music libraries. That's the one thing. And the other is that if this is something you want to do as a career, diversification in how you earn money is so important. So that's kind of the, the supporting foundation of, of this video. Okay, number one, you could grow your catalog exponentially and start your own library, your music library. A lot of my friends or colleagues, uh, the people I know that have started libraries are musicians, that they, a lot of them started or are still do what you and I do. Probably a lot less because the amount of administration involved in running a library is just unbelievable. And I that would probably be a great video for me to do is to speak to you know, a couple different library owners that, that, that can give you more of an insight because I can only tell you what it's been from my experience, but I'm on the other side of the, the fence, right? And I can only repeat what they've told me. But 
I'll make a note of that. I think it would be great information to have. You could start your own library. There have been lots and lots of successful people that have done that, that have started out as composers and producers like you and I with a decent sized catalog um, and, and grown that to either get the attention of various labels and landed distribution deals. Um, in most cases, those individuals have grown their team and work with a larger group of, of professionals or people. And the benefit to kind of growing a team like that and growing a, let's call it what it is, a company, a business, the more people you have working with you, contributing, the more your output, the bigger your catalog, the bigger your return on investment, the, the royalties, the publishing as well. There are a lot of benefits and I won't go too far down that rabbit hole, but just know that it's if, if you're one of these people that have huge aspirations, and I know there's a lot of you out there, starting your own library is not that silly of an idea. And number two, those of you that have a unique talent or skill, it serves you really well to get that talent out there, use social media, all those different platforms to promote that unique talent that you have. Because it's not only music libraries that will possibly, uh, let's say, scout you. Uh, there are a million other opportunities. And as an example, sound design. If you are an exceptional sound designer, super creative, and you do unique things that, that nobody else or very few other people do, that's a commodity that will definitely earn you money and opportunities. So leverage that, meet people, put together some kind of promo or showcase and just get that stuff out there. I use sound design as one example. Maybe you're a session drummer and you've worked with a ton of big names or a guitarist. You kind of see where I'm going with this. Is that same with mixing? Maybe you're a mix engineer and you've done some really notable stuff or, or maybe it's a, a really unique style of music that is in demand, but just not a lot of people can really nail that stuff a lot of times in in briefs from various libraries or publishers they'll look for period music so maybe 40s 50s music but they want it so authentic or it's or it's from a region somewhere in the world and it has to be absolutely authentic you can't there's no sample library that's going to to do that but maybe that's maybe that's your skill use your strengths to step ahead of the crowd or or create opportunities that those around you can't achieve because they don't have that skill or that strength or at least not to the caliber that you do three three is kind of i guess there's kind of three a b and c there's three things packed into number three the first path that i'll mention is trailer music now most of you have either heard the term or you know exactly what it is you know think of epic hybrid music and you know, a lot of times it's rocktronic or rock orchestral fusion with electronic elements big booms and swooshes and rises and drops and brams and all that that stuff that you know in those blockbuster trailers right a lot of sound design in that stuff i'll say right now typically speaking it's a much higher demand of production value uh, it's a more difficult industry to get into although a lot more music libraries now are offering various albums in their catalog that are trailer-esque or or will promote them as, as trailer tracks but there are dedicated trailer music houses and equally so there are some incredibly talented trailer music composers and that's all they do is this trailer music it's a different story it's a different form there are different budgets involved if you're not entirely aware of that industry it's worth doing a bit of google youtube um, research but trailer music is definitely a path that I know a lot of you have the skill to possibly pursue and go down. Um, so I'll note that as 3A. 3B, video game, video game music, the video game industry. Again, it's, it's I think, worth noting that it's kind of an industry onto itself and most big brands will hire composers for their their brands. I mean, it's it's you're not talking little reality show TV placements here. Um, there's a lot more on the table. Not to say that there aren't opportunities in that industry. It's just a lot more intense than writing music for non-scripted television. Now, I am not a video game composer by any stretch, although ironically, it was a video game that actually got me my start in, <laughs> in production music. It was uh, one of the Sims franchise. It was Sims Space Station. 
a long time ago, 2005, 2004. Um, it was a contest and I entered the contest. I kind of learned what sync was all about. Sync licensing was all about before there was all these libraries and YouTube channels that we know of now. There was really very little resources available to me, but I started pulling on that ball of yarn and here we are today. So, so definitely consider the video game world, especially if you're a, a gamer and you know that world, it might just be a, a perfect fit. And three C. So, I can only speak to what my experience has been and perhaps you're in the ad world as well and have had a different experience. Please comment below if you have. But my experience has been that, or my perception has been that ad work is a lot more intense, um, a lot more than, than production music. You usually have a deadline and you have say a few weeks um, or even a couple days to turn something around. In the ad world, you're usually working A, when you do a demo, which is basically you're competing against a, a, another group of composers who are fighting to ultimately win that job, meaning you're the only composer that is going to go forward and work on this, this job for whatever that brand is, brand X. And there's usually much bigger budgets on the table, bigger purses than, than you know, even sync money in the production music world. But it's fast, it's high paced, you have to tell an incredibly detailed story. And sometimes that's with less music. I don't mean to suggest sometimes you have to create these huge big mock-ups to tell this story. Your music has to be very effective um, in telling a story. And quite often you're, you're spotting, you're hitting to picture. So it, it's, it's a different world. Again, you're working with the, another medium of video, whereas when you write for um, musical libraries, you're not always working very rarely are you working with video so but I'll say this I love working in both worlds I love writing albums for music libraries and having a bit more breathing room and I love the thrill of writing advertising tracks now again you will find libraries that have albums that they'll pitch or sell or brand as advertising music but it's still needle drop and it's very different than being hired to create something bespoke or something very specific. So music and advertising is definitely another path. Okay, we're gonna stand up because, well, coffee. <laughs> it makes me antsy. And number four. So some of the reasons that a video editor, a network, a music supervisor, any professional that uses music for their projects, the reason quite often that they'll use a library over somebody directly like you and I, is quite often because of a history of trust, um, dependability, again, proven dependability over time, variety, because a music library is gonna have a much bigger catalog than you and I. The contracts will have been either developed, prepped, reviewed by a legal professional, a lawyer, um, so there's less chance of any arising issues. Uh, so even though there are a lot of reasons why professionals would use a music library over directly you and I, there are still some advantages that you and I can bring to the table that a music library can. So just as a suggestion to you, think about wedding photographers. Yes, a lot of wedding photographers and videographers will use library music, but that's not to say you can't contact them let them hear some of your music that is very specific to weddings and that kind of celebration. Or surely there's a ton of different um, realtors and real estate companies around you that, that of course, all have you know the, the video walkthroughs of the houses they're selling. And one thing I'll mention here that I think is, is an open market, and I don't know why anybody hasn't really tapped into it yet, is that quite often the music that they use for these home tours is horrible. It's, it's absolutely horrible it's atrocious it's I think real estate for those of you that are business savvy and can put together a pitch and a project the idea is that there's an audience there there's a market there's a need there's a demand it's an opportunity for you to um, you know meet some people maybe not shake hands but but you get the idea and lastly number five and my last piece of advice whether you go beyond the music library world or you don't is to double down. If you're gonna stay in the music library world and, and reach out to libraries and try and get your, your tracks in those catalogs, double down. And what I mean is 
really make that relationship work. And why I say that is because so many more doors can open and, and so many more opportunities can present themselves when you get to be personable, when, you, when you're able to show the people behind the scenes, the people you're working with, maybe it's an administrative staff, maybe it's the actual CEO or the, the founder of the company themselves. The point is you get to know who people are and you, and you present yourself and brand as a person, not just your music. So you work with them, you show them that you want to grow together, you want to be successful together, that you're a dependable person, you have all those qualities and work ethics that, that you would want somebody working with you to have. You want them to think of you when they have an opportunity. I mean, most of you know that a lot of libraries will put out briefs and basically it's a call to action. The, they need something, maybe a client has come to that library, looked for something, they couldn't quite find what they wanted, They'll speak with the library. The library will put out an email blast. Sometimes it's only to a select few people that opt into that list. Sometimes they have a, their own list, a roster of go-to composers. Um, but the point is they'll put out these opportunities that are above and beyond what you would see on their website. They don't necessarily have, hey, looking for, but sometimes there's opportunities there. And if you make it known that you're hungry for that work, for those opportunities, and that you're dependable and that you turn things around, your work is consistently on point. If there's metadata involved that, that you're doing all that, and basically just be of value to them and a lot more doors and opportunities will open and present themselves to you. And especially for those of you that are just starting, just learning what the music library world is, I just wanted to let you know that there are other lanes that you can go down to if you're inspired to do so or motivated to do so that definitely play to a lot of our strengths in, in creating music. And in the interest of this being, you know, a community where we all learn from each other, please do comment down below if you have other ideas or or, or you feel like sharing other ideas or maybe paths that you've gone down or things you've learned that are opportunities above and beyond music library stuff. So don't forget to find me on social media, my friends, and we will catch you in next week's video. I'm feeling kind of inspired to write some nice therapeutic music.